Welcome to the introduction to the quantum mechanical model of the atom. I want to warn you before we start this video that many parts of this uh, model will seem really offbeat and bizarre to you. But uh, remember that this is a model based on the mathematical um, formulas and that actually has uh, proven to be pretty accurate in describing behavior of atoms. So the quantum me mechanical model of the atom came about um, after Niels Bohr's solar system model of the atom as uh, experimentation proved that his model wasn't sufficient to explain the behavior of atoms more complex than hydrogen. And in um, trying to explain this complex behavior, three scientists were instrumental, instrumental in coming up with this uh, new model. Uh, the three were Heisenberg, de Broglie, and Schrodinger. And they came up with what they called the quantum mechanical, or sometimes called the wave mechanical, model of the atom. The first premise of this model is that electrons don't actually move in prescribed orbitals like the planets move around the sun. And in fact, their <clears throat> location and motion is much more complex. So the first part is that electron location can only be described in terms of probabilities. So in other words, if we somehow could take a, a picture, a stop action picture of a hydrogen atom, here's the nucleus, we might see its electron here, and then another picture might see, see it here. Not that it's actually possible to take these pictures, but that its location would vary around the nucleus of an atom, not in a circular pattern, but in a much more random pattern. And that we can't say at any given time exactly where this electron will be, only where its area of high probability or area of most likely location will be. A good comparison might be to the motion of a bee around a flower, where sometimes the bee is in close to the flower, over to the different flower. It's moving around kind of a random pattern, and we can't say at any exact moment where that bee will be. But we could draw a circle around that region and say that at any given time there's a high probability that that B will be located somewhere in this area. Likewise with the electrons around an atom we can't say exactly where those electrons will be but we can circle an area where the electron is most likely to be found and in fact uh, what these scientists did then is describe the electron location in terms of what they called space orbitals, or an area of high probability of electron location. Space orbital is an area in which the electron is likely to be found 90% of the time around the given nucleus. So again, the first part of this model is that electrons can only be described, electron location can only be described in terms of probability. So now a picture of a hydrogen atom becomes much fuzzier than it was before instead of in, in Bohr's model. Instead of having an orbital where the electron is found, now there's a region around this nucleus where the electron is likely to be located 90% of the time. Okay, the second premise of the quantum mechanical model is that electron energy and location are described by a set of four quantum numbers. Now each of these is given as a number, but they describe a different uh, aspect of the electron's energy and its location. So the first is what we call the principal quantum number, and the symbol for the principal quantum number is an n. The principal quantum number describes the average distance of the electron from the nucleus. Now remember the electron's location varies as it moves around the nucleus. The principal quantum number is a number from one to seven, where one means that the electron is in close to the nucleus, moving slowly, relatively speaking, so what we call a low energy electron, all the way out to seven, which represents an electron moving far from the nucleus, much faster or high energy. Sometimes these numbers, one through seven, are called the electron energy levels. So you'll hear us talk about an electron in the third energy level or fourth energy level and that corresponds to that electron having a principal quantum number of one or four or whatever it might be. The second quantum number 
is what's called the angular momentum quantum number, or L. Sometimes this would be called the orbital quantum number because it describes the shape of the space orbital where the electron is likely to be found. Now, the orbital quantum number is a number, but it corresponds to these four possible shapes. The first possibility is what's called an S orbital. An S orbital is the simplest kind of orbital, simply a spherical shape centered around the nucleus. Every energy level, one through seven, possesses S orbitals. The second energy level, excuse me, the second uh, type of orbital is what's called a P orbital. And a P orbital is, pen's going wild on me here, a P orbital is what's sometimes called a dumbbell shape. And as you can see, the nucleus would be here and the electron would be located in one of these two lobes of the um, orbital. So that's a little bit more complex. The third energy level, uh, I keep saying energy level, the third type of orbital are what are called d orbitals. And as you can see, d orbitals are kind of like two p orbitals stuck together, or in this case, the, the so-called dumbbell with a donut shape. It's uh, even more complex yet. And the final possibility for the second quantum number is what's called an f orbital. And as you can see, f orbitals become quite complex. They're just color coded here so that you can kind of see the different parts of them. So once again, the different possibilities for the second quantum number are summarized as S, P, D, or F. Now the different, uh, the first two quantum numbers relate to each other as shown here. When the principal quantum number is a one, or the electrons in the first energy level, the only type of orbital present is an s orbital. There's no such thing as a 1p or a 1d or a 1f orbital. If the principal quantum number is a 2 or the electron is in the second energy level, it can occupy an s orbital or it can occupy a p orbital. In the third energy level, we add another type of orbital. Third energy level has s orbital, p orbital, and it can have d as well. And finally, in all of the others, the fourth through seventh energy level, the type of orbitals which might be present include all four types, S, P, D, and F. And so that's how the principal quantum number and the angular momentum quantum number relate to each other. The third quantum number, or magnetic quantum number, indicates the orientation of the orbital around the nucleus, or the axis upon which it lies. Now, an s orbital only can have one possible orientation, with the nucleus at the center and the orbital around it. And of course, as you rotate a sphere, like a picture, like a basketball or a tennis ball, it looks the same from all different sides. A p orbital can have three possible orientations. One uh, p orbital lying on the x-axis, p orbital lying on the y-axis, or a p orbital lying on the z-axis. So we have the px, the py, and the pz. And continuing this pattern, the d orbital can have five different orientations, which we won't name here. And the f orbitals can have seven different orientations. So in looking at a picture of this, this represents the single type or single orientation of an s orbital. The nucleus is at the center. These are the three different orientations of p orbitals. This is the px with the lobes of the peanut lying on the x-axis. This is the py. And here is the pz. So these are the three different orientations of the p orbitals. Okay, the d orbitals can have five possible orientations, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for their names, but you can see that they lie on a different combination of the x, y, and z axes. And in fact, there are four d orbitals of one shape and one d orbital of a different shape. 
And then finally, the f orbitals can lie in five different possible, or excuse me, seven different possible orientations. And you can see that these become highly complex. The final, uh, fourth and final quantum number is called the spin quantum number, m sub s. And it turns out that along with moving throughout space around the nucleus, the electrons are also spinning around on their own axes like so. And so the spin quantum number can be one of two possibilities. It can be either written as a positive one-half or a negative one-half. And this isn't to imply you know, clockwise or counterclockwise, only the relative spins of the electrons. In other words, if two electrons are positive one-half spin electrons, they're spinning the same direction. If one electron is a negative one-half, it is spinning the opposite direction. So now we can kind of put all of this together and uh, look at a couple of electrons. So let's say that one electron is completely described as a 3pz plus one half electron. So now what does this tell us about the electron? It's in the third energy level out of seven, so it's relatively close to the nucleus, fairly uh, low in energy, that it's in a dumbbell-shaped orbital which is lying on the z-axis around the nucleus, and it has a relative spin of plus one-half. So now if we compare that to a second electron in the same atom, which let's say is a 2s minus one-half electron, what is similar about them and what is different? Well, in this case, there really is, is nothing that's similar. This one is in the second energy level compared to the other one, which means that it's closer to the nucleus of lower energy. It's in a spherical shaped orbital and there's no x, y, or z or orientation because remember s orbitals only have one orientation and it has the opposite spin of the first electron too. So when we write all four quantum numbers like this we, we have as best we can completely described the energy, the location, and the behavior of that electron. So as, as I told you before, this gets pretty um, obscure at times and we'll keep practicing and there are some shorthand ways of writing this that will make sense to you. So good luck and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Bye.